the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. We're here today with Baman Zahori, who is a professor at Golden Gate University and has also written about I don't know, what is it, two dozen books on topics that I'm curious about around nuclear energy, but also a variety of other topics. Baman, mm -hmm. welcome to Titans of Nuclear. Thank you very much for inviting me to your broadcasting here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a few books, uh, you know, I came across you because there were a few books uh, that I was just reading in my off time that you had written, a couple textbooks. It started mm -hmm. off with reading a book on compact heat exchangers, mm -hmm. but then uh, very quickly, you know, I'm looking through the um, uh, the citations uh, and also found a whole, that you had written a whole bunch of other books as well. And so I started devouring those too. And so your topics include everything from thermohydraulic thermo analysis of nuclear reactors, thermodynamics, combined cycle efficiency, advanced small reactors, compact heat exchangers. That was the area that got me in a couple books on that. And you, you also do heat pipe design, you do some fusion, and that's all just within the nuclear section, but it's but you also cover mm -hmm. a few other topics as well. Yeah, pretty much I covered the, most of A to Z related subjects to nuclear engineering and nuclear industry, which includes both fusion and fusion. And originally my uh, uh, background and uh, uh, via the education, it was fusion, but I got interested into the fusion as well because fusion for a while went to halt. So you got to switch, yeah. move on. <laughs> well, actually, can we talk about your background a little bit? Let's start sure. off with where did you grow up to begin with? I grew up in Iran and uh, left that country around 1970, came to United States for my education under previous regime that we were selected by our previous government to specifically come to certain universities in the United States, get our education and get back to our old country because Shah of Iran at that time was very ambitious to get his hand on nuclear weapons. So we were particularly selected to come and get educated in that arena. <laughs> okay, so they sent you out here and then what happened? Then, of course, uh, once I almost finished uh, my second PhD uh, at the University of Illinois, a revolution happened there without your consent. Nobody asked my opinion. <laughs> Yet I got a letter from uh, a new government that they are not interested to having us back because the statement was we are too Americanized. And I said, fine, I'll stay where I am. <laughs> wow. Wow. And does that mean you weren't able to see your family anymore? Or what was the ability to, to at least travel back and forth like? Uh, I never left uh, U.S. when I came here uh, because wow. uh, after that episode that happened and uh, we ended up staying, few of us ended up staying, including me, we got uh, absorbed by U.S. government into certain sector of government. I got involved in a lot of classified stuff that naturally I couldn't go back anymore nor I have any desire to go back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we're glad that we got the genius imported here. That's, <laughs> sometimes it doesn't always go that way. You know, sometimes yeah. we send our best and brightest back, but at least we got to keep you. You know, a lot of folks uh, are leaving, exodus of brains or uh, in process of leaving that country, which is a huge asset they are losing, but if that's their feeling, so be it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the topic of your studies. Actually, first, let me ask: you 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 write a lot of books. Mm -hmm. Why write so many books as opposed to writing papers or as opposed to just teaching? Where does the drive to publish these comprehensive textbooks come from? What are you trying to accomplish on top of the existing literature? 
When I was growing up in Iran, I went to my high school there and first year of uh, college be uh, before they decided to send me to U.S. to go to the best of the best schools here. At that time, Shah of Iran had a lot of uh, contact with universities such as MIT, U of I, uh, Caltech, and all those. I decided to go to University of Illinois because when I was growing up, I saw a big portrait of Oppenheimer in that university, a picture of it back in back home. And I thought he's teaching in that school. And I said, okay, I want to go to University of Illinois. And happened to be one of the top of the school uh, when it comes to physics and, uh, and nuclear engineering particularly. So uh, growing up, I noticed that we need a lot of resources that we don't have the capability of also translating English to Farsi and naturally English was our second language and I tried to do my best to learn as much as possible to be able to read these books but then I found out some of the books existing in the market at that time are good but they are very complex and you need to grow up into it and build up your foundation so I had some interest to publish books, particularly when I was working on a um, combined cycle. And as a result, I needed the compact heat exchanger understanding. I decided, okay, uh, I like to start writing. When Once I started writing, and uh, particularly my first book, which was Advanced Heat Pipe Technology that I learned in Westinghouse when I was working for them on Clean Sugar Project. And I noticed there are a lot of papers, but they are not all combined under one mm -hmm. roof. So that's how I got interested and I started writing books. Once I wrote, then publishers see the uh, positive reaction to it and ask me, am I interested to write another subject, another subject? So one comes after another one, next thing you know, you wrote a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah. Do you know how many you've written total? Uh, yes, I do. About 64 of them. 64? But yes, <laughs> I've got a list of like 20 or 30 here. I didn't realize it was that no, many. I know 64 of them, different subjects, of course. And because my interest got changed during growing into technology, growing into the science. And, <laughs> and I know at least uh, five of them has been translated in different languages. Right. And uh, I know for a fact at least two or three of them in certain areas been translated to Chinese and Russians. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, okay, so how long does it take you to write a book and what's your process? Obviously, you've got it down to a science, uh, doing so many. So what is it? How do you do it? Well, it's just you think about it. And one of my hobbies is bicycling. When I bicycle for long distance, my brain just goes and I don't feel the distance. That's why I ride because by the time I finish that cycling I do, I come up with ideas and then sit down and put it together. And I start doing research on average to answer your question. It takes about a year and a half to possibly two years to go from starting the idea, conceptual idea, put it into production by the time it goes to peer review and goes back and forth and selection of publisher. Of course, these days, a lot of publisher approach me. I don't approach them. Uh, Springer was in particularly insisting that I write more books for them because few of my books is top seller for them. Although personally, I don't like to support them anymore. <laughs> Elsevier is another one who is continuously approaching me writing books. I wrote at least 10 books for them in different subjects. And another, another one is uh, uh, Wiley that they are also reaching out. So I haven't published anything with Wiley. I don't think so. Most of them are Springer, CRC, and also uh, uh, Elsevier. And, uh, okay, so if it takes two years from start to finish, but you've written 64 of them, certainly you must be doing them and you must be overlapping how you're doing them. So at any yes, time, you've got three or four going. different subjects. You know, considering that uh, I, I'm an old man, my kids grown up, gone, so I have plenty of time in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so my best friend is uh, my computer, and when I do research, my, my mind really goes and keeps me busy because... Uh, besides watching the news, I don't watch anything else on TV, so I spend my time in front of my uh, screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And do you have any famous, um, not famous, do you have any favorites 
uh, authors from previous generations, maybe who are no longer with us, but that are good for foundational information on this. One I can think of is Sam Glastone. I've read exactly. I was I was okay. going to say that I learned a great deal of his books, and also one of my uh, uh, how should I say a person that I admire and gets a lot of inspiration to me is Hans Petty. I love that guy. I went to a lot of his lecture okay. when he was given at the, uh, New York and his university, Columbia. I think he was there. And uh, I was in Rochester doing my uh, postdoc there with University of Rochester and Laser Laboratory. I had the opportunity to go to listen to him. He really fascinates, fascinated me at that time. I should say because he passed away, I think 2005 or something. And... Uh, He's one of my favorite guy. I mean, okay, I love listening to him. Yeah, I don't know you know him or not, but I he's... I don't not off the top of my head, but maybe I've I've you know I've begun to build my own library over the last six or seven years. I you know I have a few hundred textbooks on on almost all on nuclear, yeah. but uh, um so I might have some of his work. I just it's you know like Sam Glaston. I I've, I'm just obsessed with his work because I think he's just such a clear writer mm -hmm. and it's so. And it was at the dawn of the industry too. And so like, I just can't help but like transport myself back and pretend I'm a 1950s, yeah. you know, like 20 something amazing. engineer. He was an amazing uh, author. And also the Hans Petty, if you recall, they always said Oppenheimer is the uh, father of the atomic bomb and Edward Teller is mother of hydrogen bomb. And Hans Petty said, then in that case, I'm child of atomic bomb because he was in Manhattan Project uh, and he was one of the leader of that project and most of uh, advanced innovation that we went through and created it was done by him. Mathematically, he was genius and a strong person. And what a memory he had. I was always amazed with his memory. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I'm going to, um, I, I've just searched him. I've got his name. I'm going to start trying to collect his yeah his he works. won uh, 1964 nobel prize i think okay amazing very well known german scientist who uh, came to us during manhattan project one of those uh, folks uh, jewish folks that left europe amazing during, yeah okay and, let me let me ask um yes sir out of these topics that you've explored mm -hmm. Um, let's start with the ones in the nuclear space specific, because there's so many others. We could have many other conversations. As a matter of fact, we could probably do three or four conversations just in the nuclear section. So we'll stick there for now and make this an, at least an overview podcast. Which topic did you learn the most in researching where it wasn't just like a regurgitation of previous ideas in, in a better, more concise format, but you actually uncovered something that you hadn't learned in your studies when you were putting together the books? Oh, a lot of my books that I wrote, certainly uh, uh, I didn't uh, learn about them during my education, okay? Because most of our classic book was not going to granular level that I went to my books because my books are very specific. And when I started writing, I remember first publisher who approached me was uh, CRC and then next to them was a Springer and I made a deal with that public uh, editor at that time with the Springer saying, let me write a sequence of the book. So we cover from A to Z of nuclear industry because there is a lot in nuclear industry. And even today, when uh, folks graduating from nuclear engineering, even at, as far as uh, PhD is concerned, they are not really highly educated uh, per se for industrial application. I've noticed yeah. that. I've noticed that. So what's going on there? That's uh, again, because, uh, <laughs> sorry, I have to jump on some of my colleagues at university, partic particularly UNM was very disappointing for me when I was teaching there that I noticed a lot of professors are old and they have no clue what's going on in industry and they want to, they don't want to update themselves as a yeah. result. Keep feeding same old fashioned stuff that is no longer applies. So might as well get on with it. So I noticed I have to cover those vacuum area and be able to feed the books that uh, really helps you to grow up in industry. Because if you go to Westinghouse, for example, General Electric, or for that matter, any nuclear and commercial industry, 
you got to be on a speed very quick. So yep. classical books don't bring you to that point. Particularly, yeah. it's very disappointed that if you have a PhD and you go there and you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I I have to say the thing that upsets me the most when I talk to even other nuclear entrepreneurs that maybe have some sort of advanced reactor prototype or advanced reactor concept mm -hmm. is that their understanding of materials are as if they're in its purest form at all times, as if like you can actually order, you know, pure boron or pure lead or pure bismuth or pure even water. Um, and that, and you could just magically put it in your paper reactor and it'll behave according to like the perfect physics of that perfect molecule. And they don't understand that in reality, nothing is pure and that leads to corrosion or all sorts of other challenges. And even the smallest amount of things can, uh, I say this literally and figuratively, like bubble up in your system mm. and mm. become a real problem. Is that one of the challenges that, that you've seen as well? Yes, exactly. For example, when I got involved my first job with Westinghouse that they hired me out of the, my school, and uh, put me into Clinch River project, which was uh, a liquid metal fast rigid reactor that we were working on. And uh, unfortunately, Carter administration killed that project. We had no clue what's going on when Three Mile Island took place. And we had no inherent shutdown system as a backup to be able to recover from such a events. So as a result, idea of heat pipe came about. Mm. How can we use it as secondary loop for cooling system to prevent any incident of that nature and be able to recover from it before melting uh, events take place? And as a result, I looked at the first idea of heat pipe and I came across of a paper by a guy named Cutter at Los Alamos. And that's how I see it as an application into nuclear industry. And when I started digging in, I couldn't find really exactly related to that subject. So I had to develop my own conceptual ideas and understanding of it. That's why I ended up writing my first book. And, ha and although it was not a good publication at that time, I was learning how to publish a book. So I had a lot of uh, uh, errors here and there. But when the second edition of it got published by Springer, my goodness, a lot of hit because exactly was hitting the same issue I faced myself as an as engineer there that I didn't have that knowledge. Yes. And a lot of folks apparently were in the same boat. <laughs> so t t let's, let's focus on heat pipes for a second. Like what are the main points and concepts about heat pipes that are both, um, uh, that could provide both opportunities for the nuclear sector, but also that are hidden challenges that need, uh, that need to have engineered solutions around some of some some of the things that they've introduced as well challenges were there at the beginning but a lot of solution was offered around it and today there is no challenges for it. As a matter of fact is perfect innovation that you can easily put it into application of uh, nuclear industry it doesn't matter whether it's fusion or fusion particularly not that you can launch it into a space for the same cooling system is a very passive and a closed system that does not need any outside resource in order to be able to function properly so long as you are within envelope of that design for that particular application perfectly works so so heat pipes um heat pipe is a way to move um heat from point a to point b essentially you have um, uh, some sort of coolant to, yeah. uh, to condenser and vice versa Exactly. So, okay. So you have a heat source and you have a heat sink and you have natural circulation through some sort of piping system, or could it even be in a giant pool or what's considered a heat pipe? Basically think of about a cylinder that is capped off on both sides, uh, both end, uh, and one side is sink. The other one, uh, of course, is uh, dumping the heat and uh, uh, bring the natural circulation back to uh, circulation. There is four parameters you have to cons uh, take under consideration when you did uh, designing a heat pipe to match your app particular application. On, tho uh, on those four uh, uh, parameters that you have to look at it, one is con uh, uh, speed of uh, sonic limit, they call it, that the, your, uh, your uh, liquid that it goes from liquid uh, phase to to vapor phase should not reach to that limit. 
Otherwise, you have choking in within that. Uh, and and does part. a heat pipe necessitate a phase change, or can you circulate fluid in a single phase? Uh, that's where those parameters plays. Uh, one, the other one is uh, uh, besides sonic limit is entrainment limit, the leaking limit, that sort of a things that prevents changing the phase. Okay, and uh, uh, be able to have natural circulation going on. And then, of course, uh, uh, you have to know which type of a media you're going to use, whether it's mercury, whether it's sodium, potassium, alcohol, even in uh, your computer that is sitting in front of you, the laptop or whatever you're using, the heat pipe exists there and is not using mercury or sodium, uh, yet in reactor, particularly liquid metal fast breeder reactor, you prefer to use sodium and uh, potassium or sometimes mercury for that matter. So in the computer, you can see acetone or alcohol for that matter. So, And do the same sense. principles that you would analyze a heat pipe system apply if the media is water, like in these naturally circulating uh, reactors? Could, is that a, ki you, a kind of heat pipe of sorts? You, you could use that. Uh, yes, of course, you want to use a media that is not hazardous into the core of reactor and uh, causes the core to be contaminated. You need you need to be as much as possible close to what uh, that natural circulation media is. Naturally, for boiling or light water reactors, that considers boiling and pressurized water reactor and it's water. So you prefer to use something near that. Okay. And have we seen um, the successful application of heat pipe technology in any of their reactors? A lot. A yeah, lot. Let's walk through some of that. Uh, for fact, uh, Phoenix uh, uh, project that the uh, French uses it after our uh, withdrawal from liquid metal fast fuel reactor at uh, Clean River project that Westinghouse was leading, they use heat pipe in their technology. Okay. And in a space, they are using heat pipe. In, uh, in, of course, industry, a lot of folks using heat pipe. Computer that is in front of us is a good example of it. Totally. Um, I guess maybe let me ask a question a little bit different way. Have we seen this applied to any commercial power reactors? Plant, nuclear power plant designs? Not just research reactors, but let's say for intended for power production. Not that I have seen, except what I see in uh, Phoenix 2, that French I heard used it, yes. And given the advantages, and I assume part of the advantages is just eliminating complexity, eliminating pumps in your system for forced convection. Any um, any dynamic movement, less degree of freedom, better situation you have. Okay. So I guess I'm wondering how come we don't see more and, and by the way, like I'm a, a fan of this and, and I've I've been fascinated and curious by this technology. How come we don't see it more for all you know, there's like 50 new startups uh, for nuclear technology. And you know, there have been you know dozens in the last 20, 30 years of different reactor designs, even by the big incumbents. How come we don't see a bigger push towards this just as a drive to simplification? My personal opinion is because folks are involved in the new generation and even going from Gen 3 to Gen 4, whatever SMR is falling uh, into it, uh, in those categories, you see old timer are designing these things. All they do, taking the old generation and scale it down and call it SMR. That mm -hmm. bothers me mm -hmm. <laughs> because you haven't changed anything. You got to start a new generation with the new ideas, not taking old idea <laughs> and massage it into the new one. That's why a lot of these folks commercially fail. If you look at all pioneering SMR, such as newer scale, for example, I don't know if you follow news on them. They recently been sued because they cannot deliver what they promised they can deliver. Yeah. For, for that matter, if you look at companies like even the resting costs, that AP1000 is still is AP1000, which is Gen 3, an old pumping system, cooling system. They don't even uh, march to their own drum yeah. that we generated and got patent for heat pipe at Westinghouse and for commercial purpose. I was the pioneer on it. And uh, they never put into work. <laughs> but what about students who might read your books in university and then they grow up to become you know, engineers? If they become, if yeah. they become leader, yes. Okay. But unfortunately, and have you had any anyone reach out to you and said, "I read your book and I'm trying to start a nuclear company now"? For a space purpose, yes. 
Okay. I've had a lot of startup companies coming in, but unfortunately, they don't have the funding to do it. And any new startup companies I have seen, less than size of the General Electric, Westinghouse, X Energy, and all those guys, it seems to me they are not uh, following again new ideas, new innovative ideas. For example, if we refer to my combined cycle book, mm. which is pioneer in that idea that brings efficiency of producing electricity driven by nuclear source is most efficient way of designing uh, reactors that nobody pays attention. When you're telling them, either they don't understand it or they refuse to accept it. Yet I had a very good well uh, overwhelming uh, interest from MIT, for example. I don't know, you have heard of Dr. Charles Fursberg? Yes, of course, of course. He's, uh, he, he's quite famous in the sector. Yeah, he referenced to my book and yeah. I have had at least 10 citations by him. Hey, <laughs> Bauman wrote this book on combined cycle and that brings efficiency of the uh, Tell us about reactor. that. Can you describe the combined cycle system in relation to nuclear power plants specifically? Yes. Uh, combined is uh, a system that using, op in my case, I'm suggesting open air combined cycle using Brayton ranking cycle in order to bring them as far as pinch point is concerned near each other to be able to operate within an environment that I don't need to have access to fresh water for purpose of cooling and so forth, so on, and yet using it to be able to produce uh, and did some cal uh, produce electricity and uh, calculate uh, some analysis based on that, which is fan of uh, for, uh, Charles Fersberg, and he keep telling me, Bam, I love what you wrote. <laughs> Can you massage this thing? Because originally I did my calculation based on steady state approach. And he wants me to go ahead and put a, go for transient type analysis, mm. which I don't have time for it. No, I, the, yeah, okay. The resources. Yeah, that's let's let some PhD student do that for their thesis. <laughs> yes. What? What? But tell tell me more about this system. Can you describe the um the fuel, the coolant, the moderator, the um extra technologies that need to be added to it, the turbines? Can you just walk through what that looks Basically, like? Basically, combined cycle can be used in external aspect of a reactor rather than inside the core. Okay. Yep. When it comes, uh, uh, the steam comes uh, out of the reactor, going to turbine and comes back to heat exchanger, and then converts to liquid, go back to the core, that's the outside that I am interested in using this combined cycle to be able to really do this circulation much faster so you don't need all those cooling towers, fresh water, huge heat exchanger using shell and tube technology. That's where the com compact heat exchanger plays into my uh, ah, and, and we'll get to we'll get to that in a minute. I see the yeah. thread of how you got there, but I want to stay on combined cycle for a second. So you're telling me that we have a reactor mm -hmm. and you're circulating water um, from heat source to heat sink, but that's a closed loop. And mm -hmm. what's the coolant in that closed loop typically? Uh, cooling is the combat heat exchanger that you're using. Depends on how you. Uh, sorry, I meant the, the coolant. Which fluid are you circulating in the system? The, the 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 steam that gets produced by the reactor and comes to the turbine. Okay, so it can be a normal boiling water reactor. Okay, correct. got it. Okay, either pressurized or boiling. Does as long as it's light water reactor in this case. Okay, and so you have a um a, a steam turbine and that produces electricity like normal. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now you're trying to capture another element of. Um, that is uh, steam. Okay. That, uh, yeah. So, so, so basically, the most you can get in that typical cycle would be, let's say, thirty-five percent out of the um, uh, out of the direct conversion of thermal energy to, to electrical, the electrical energy. Yeah. Electrical, okay. Yeah. How much extra percent can you capture? And walk us through what what's the physical equipment in that cycle, and and how does it make electricity? Depends on the design. How many turbine you want to use, and compressor you want to use. Whether you want to use one of them, two of them. Um, my calculation went up to five, and wrote the computer code around it, and got better efficiency out of it. And uh, depends on wattage of the reactor. Whether you're looking at 10 megawatt uh, or 25 megawatt depends on the also uh, na nature of the SMR that you're designing. 
Beautiful. So let's start with an example. Let's say 25 megawatt and five. 25 uh, megawatt, uh, which originally uh, 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 New Scale was very interested, and they approached me and they asked me, "Can I come work for them?" In, in, in that case, I suggested four uh, combined uh, uh, turbine and uh, also heat exchanger for it, comp uh, compressor and heat exchanger, and put it in there some. Uh, uh, artistic uh, drawing and based on wrote the code around it and showed I can jump from 35% that as you mentioned which typically nuclear reactor produce going from nuclear energy to electrical output based on the calculation and I did and as a result believe it or not sometimes I deviate to the explain I end up writing the table of content for a steam because what I found in thermodynamic book books were wrong at the temperature I was interested. So I had to uh, generate my own numbers and wrote the code. Okay, so I, I, I'm gonna come back to that point because I also think that there's a fundamental flaw in thermodynamics textbooks themselves. Exactly. I, I, I've always found it insane that they, that they cap the amount of energy that can be captured between a hot well and a cold well to anything mm -hmm. except 99% of like whatever that energy is. It, to me, mm -hmm. it makes no sense that you're imposing these like artificial limitations. Who is this? Um, was it Carnot or who, who limit, who limited this to, and used entropy as a excuse? I think, I think it was Carnot. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like the Carnot limit. I, I don't think it makes sense. And I think combined cycle in the oil and gas industry prove that it doesn't Proved make it. any sense. Yes. So uh, what's going on here? Like, I don't know. How, how can we, people but it's every don't. textbook. It's every single textbook on thermodynamics, and it makes no sense. That's why one of the deriving factors behind me writing that uh, application of thermodynamic in nuclear engineering was exactly because of that, because I didn't see any thermodynamic book that really deviated from old fashioned thermodynamic and they yes. didn't fix those numbers. It's like, it's like, it's like classics. It's like, we're even like pre Newton in our understanding of thermodynamics when right. we stick to this Carnot limit. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, Good. okay. Well, I'm uh, glad I found someone. I thought, I thought I was crazy. No, like, no, no. I found out particularly around uh, 650 C to 750 C. I was interested about those esteem uh, numbers and I found them wrong. I thought my, my calculation is wrong, but after I really paid more attention and ran it by a colleague of mine and we both uh, end up writing these uh, computer code and generate, all of a sudden, boom, everything was coming right on target as far as number is concerned. Okay. And that's why Charles uh, jumped yeah. on it right away. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. I feel like I'm looking at a mirror right now because like, yeah, I read these textbooks. I built my own like Excel models, not nothing even too sophisticated. But then I was coming up with like theoretical efficiencies, even at 300 C that you could get of over 60%. And I'm like, where is everyone losing all this energy and just pretending that it's a law of nature? Yeah, that's how we found out. And uh, when uh, originally I saw Fersberg approaching Berkeley, for example, on their uh, uh, one guy there, I can't remember his name, uh, uh, Peterson, Per Peterson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some, of, uh, some of his students uh, producing those numbers, and he asked me, can I do something about it? I was trying to uh, work with him, but didn't work out. Uh, I did on Excel calculation-based yeah. scenario approach, but then when you get more sophisticated, you say you need a code. So we start writing old-fashioned Fortran code. You know, you grow up in that. As you know. So, <laughs> Fortran uh, was, was before my time, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a lot of my students, when you're talking to them about it, they say, what language is that? We never heard of it. You're like a Martian language. <laughs> <laughs> so I did start in high school. They taught us basic first, basic yeah. and visual basic. But then yeah, you go to yeah. C and it's yeah. like you skip over Fortran. Anyway, I grew up with Fortran and I I think I'm a guru of Fortran language. To, <laughs> to this point, even some defense companies these days calling me up and uh, go to consult with them to to explain those existing code we wrote those days and say how it works and teach exactly. them how to read the code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Northrop is one of my big clients that continuously they ask me, come I'm and work on this particular <laughs> classified code. And the minute I look at it, oh, it's my favorite language. <laughs> I can't understand what it says. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, we jumped the efficiency for that particular design that we use a combination of uh, four uh, compressor and heat exchanger as a combined cycle. 
uh, and by going to a compact heat exchanger, we reduce the pinch point between ranking and and uh, Brayton cycle, we reach efficiency to almost 60%, at least okay, theoretically. Yeah. That yeah. was awesome. Yeah. That was yeah. awesome. So at that time... And, and sorry, real real quick, do, um, do you need extraction stages from your main turbine in order to run it through these compact heat exchangers, or is it at the very bottom of the cycle that you're doing this? Very bottom of cycle. Okay, got it. So that's why it can be either bottom of cycle or top of the cycle, either got it. way. Okay. Got it. And you need compact heat exchangers just because of the amount of of fluid that you're going to flow through that and and you don't want to have a huge huge array of systems yes and okay so that comes down to a cost so you wouldn't need right. compact if steel was free and machining yes. steel was free yes but because you you want to make it realistic realistic and, like it, it, and roi and total cost of ownership gets reduced exactly exactly that's how we looked at the compact and then like Looked at the first book by London and some other guy out of Stanford, Compact is Exchanger. That wasn't giving me enough knowledge and information, yet I learned enough to write my own version. That's yeah. how I use all my compact heat exchangers there. Yeah, and, and um, compact heat exchangers, these are made in production today for all sorts of interesting- A lot of them, a lot of them. Huge and, companies. And which industry- uses it the most would you say uh i would say oil company using it and now they're, they're use, uh, looking at the space technology yeah. to use it but uh, preferably they rather use heat pipe for that purpose and and given how much from what i understand about compact heat exchangers is for the same power density it can be like five times as small maybe even 10 times as small how come all shell and tube heat exchangers given just the weight and you know all of the welding complexities and how come they why is it not immediately advantageous to replace all shell and tubes with some sort of compact heat exchanger because a lot of folks grew up into it and <laughs> compact heat exchanger is another innovative approach to it and by old timer to really get accustomed to these new technologies it takes time okay and so it's, it's just a, a matter of inertia it has yes. nothing to do with, there's no fundamental flaw of the technology itself. No. Compact and and compact heat exchangers, are there subcategories of this that we could walk through as well? Are there different techniques to make it a compact heat exchanger? One I know about is printed circuit heat exchanger. That's right. one type, right? One type. But are there yeah. other types as well? Like, is there a form of plate and frame that might also be considered? There are at least four or five of them uh, technologically that you can design compact heat exchanger. On top of my head, I don't remember all the technology, but my book is classified them nicely. Yeah. If you look at my book, uh, uh, compact heat exchanger, because I wrote it, so I don't know, almost six years ago, seven years ago, something like that. Since I deviated from that technology, my mind was somewhere else. So pretty much uh, uh, a lot of those details is not top of my head, but there are a couple of classifications okay. of compact, the same com yeah. compact heat ex exchanger that you can print it. One is one of them that is, uh, that is most common one. Yeah. And uh, they are very good to, to do it. So, a And any, any challenges with boiling inside of a compact heat exchanger? Just a few of these micro channels, could that create some sort of problem in terms of erosion on the channels? As far as erosion, the possibility is there, but going from uh, single phase to uh, uh, dual phase is not there. You try to design it so you don't get into uh, a one dimensional two phase uh, flow scenario because that causes choking and things like that that you cannot afford. I okay, see, but... and so that's maybe a limitation of compact versus shell and tube? Yeah, shell and tube even has that problem as well. Okay. Uh, then yeah. it depends on uh, what application, what temperature you try to do. Yeah, I just the thing that fascinates me, especially about the printed circuit, is that if you can etch like whatever shapes that you want into your channels, perhaps all you of prevent. these, yeah, all of these things such as you know two phase, you can almost like direct how you want it to bubble on a microscopic you basis. You can have control it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It seems yeah. to me like it's a new frontier. I mean, I'm I'm fascinated by it. And it seems to me like it's a new frontier that could be as powerful as any like new like technology like like frontier because so much of the systems in our daily life are all about just moving heat. Like heat exchangers are in every part of our daily life, like everything. Yes. So it's yes. like how are we yes. not investing more 
in this in, in the fundamental engineering of, of this burgeoning or not burgeoning it should be burgeoning a new industry a new topic that's what i'm talking about when we go into smrs and new generation of these reactors rather than taking old and trying to scale it down i don't yeah do i get it, it but like the nuclear industry has hard enough time with innovation because like the regulators and the governments they don't want yeah. you to be innovative right like everyone yeah. makes innovation hard but why doesn't for for compact heat exchangers specifically and for printed circuit exchangers, I'm surprised that the automotive industry or like a million other computer industry aren't just like embedding tiny little heat exchanger circuits in like the structural framing of like I, I have a I have a, a lap or I have a computer that I'm looking at right now, right? Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. like a metal surface exterior. And I know it's just a flat like aluminum plate. Maybe it's got some like holes poked in it for the speaker sound to come out. But why isn't the entire thing a form of compact heat exchanger used to efficiently channel airflow to the circuitry? Eventually, we're going to get there, particularly if we're moving from uh, old uh, classical type computation to quantum computing system that we are getting pushed to it. Anyway. Ah, that's going to take so long to get to quantum computing. No, I now? think... I think we are there, whether believe it or not. Uh, with quantum? To, yeah, we're going there because we have no choice. Well, what about with, going... yeah, just because you think because we got down to the three nanometer level, it's like. That and also autonomy that we are looking for and computation that we want to do real time with yeah. all this information coming at you. You have no choice. We got to get pushed there. You okay. see, I think, I think it's going to be a while for quantum, but I do think artificial intelligence is going to. Pushes it. It's gonna yeah, it's gonna either design it for us or it'll make our current computational our current chips so much more powerful by re-architecting them and rewriting a new software layer. So yeah. you're not like recomputing hard things. You're more just like pattern matching and quickly finding solutions. Of course, because a new, uh, I mean, old technology of CPU is not there to match the demand for right, processing right. purpose. You right. gotta go to CPU, CP, uh, uh, GPU. GPU, and all those yeah, things yeah. that it goes. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've already touched upon at least two of my. So these are the books that I own of yours. Are all of the ones on compact heat exchangers, uh, heat pipes, and like the basic, um, the basic uh, thermohydraulics, thermo uh, thermodynamic okay, analysis, thermodynamic. combined cycle. Yeah, that thermodynamic book of mine is uh, one of the books I'm very proud of it for at least up to my uh, in, uh, knowledge and information from Springer that I saw a statistic given to me was number one book sell for them selling book for them. And today I know Cambridge uses it for teaching, MIT uses it for teaching purpose of that textbook. And I love to see somebody taking my heat exchange, compact heat exchanger book and expand upon it and be able to write further around it. I would, that might be a project that I take on at some point. Right now I'm too busy, but like that would be my passion would, would yeah. be to expand upon your work for compact heat exchangers. Yeah, let me know because I lost my interest in uh, the because my interest now is going through the, towards a lot of other things that <laughs> recently I uh, write a book around it, particularly when I'm dealing with uh, my passionate uh, subject these days, dealing with depression and using artificial intelligence to do that and that sort of like thing. Like psychology, human psychology. psychology. Wow, yeah. Be yeah. Because... To me, that's a deadlier disease, even worse than the COVID, that we are facing uh, facing this depression in this country, and we're losing uh, almost thirty thousand folks per year it's, due it, to the depression. It's way more than that. It's way more than that because if you look at the fentanyl crisis and the hundred thousand mm. deaths there, you could classify those as depression as well. As well, yeah, particularly between age of fourteen to twenty six. Yeah, And that bothers me a lot because I think I lost my son due to that and I couldn't see it. And yeah. I said, I got to put my education and knowledge into it. Because when you're talking to the psychiatrists and psychologists, they don't understand the nature of these things from a physicist perspective. But for me, learning from them is easier for them to learn my language. So I rather go myself into it and do it because I try to explain to them using TMS technologies and transcranial magnetic stimulation and that sort of a thing. When you're talking these sort of things to them and say, hey, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, and people tend to people tend to forget their passion for learning after they get out of university and then they exactly just become Exactly happening to a lot of these old professors. I know. 
and doctors of, the worst. <laughs> doctors of the worst like, they don't change their <laughs> yeah. mind ever yeah talking to those old guys that they don't want to learn new technology i mean innovation of combined cycle was not easy to push and still there is a lot of resistance from industry to it i know i uh, it it drives me it drives me crazy but but you know what actually it's also kind of cool because that's that's opportunity whenever mm -hmm. like the old school industry stops wanting to investigate or invent or look into something that's opportunity for some young entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurial enterprising individual to create great wealth uh, for themselves and for society uh, mm -hmm. by really pushing past the old school way of thinking and by the way, don't hesitate. If you come across of, uh, any errors in any of my books that you're reading, I'll be more than happy to hear from you because I never get time to go back and see where I missed the ball. Okay, <laughs> well, I, I think if you're up for it, I know it took I a while for us to get this. I would love to maybe do a deep dive. Maybe I'll pick a book. This will have to be over the course of several months. But sure. Maybe I'll pick a book, I'll read it through, and then we can talk about it just like this over a podcast as a way to like, sure. explore some of the concepts. Absolutely. I am, I'm hoping to see that. But uh, by leaving a university, uh, particularly something like UNM, that where I was involved with the nuclear engineering department there, as well as the WLE department, and not seeing a lot of uh, how shall, shall I, compassion there from professors to support you rather than being obstacle in front of you, I said the heck with it, yeah. and left. Because like you can't fight the the entire uh, if they don't want to learn and they have a shield in, 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 uh, shield in front of their brain there is nothing you can do i mean to be honest with you i'll take a bunch of them and send them back to school and say go get your phd again come back and let's talk <laughs> maybe we should do that just like with driving <laughs> licenses we, we should send people back every five ten years honestly that's what i think that's what i think that's what i think <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're running out of time here, but I want to give you the final word. Are there any like high level thoughts you want to leave our audience? Um, just because you've looked at so much and I, I'm just so impressed with the body of work that you've accumulated and how I appreciate uh, also that. how focused it is to my interest area is kind of suspicious, <laughs> but no, I, I like if you are any final thoughts, you just want to leave our audience, please. Just uh, uh, be open-minded to learn new technologies and don't resist uh, because you don't want to come to speed. Accept folks that are offering better solution. At least give them a chance and analyze it yourself before challenging uh, ideas. For example, one of the technology I'm trying to push to industry using uh, advanced in, in core instrumentation to measure power level and water level using uh, uh, fiber uh, uh, optic uh, bragging uh, or FBG, uh, uh, fiber-based uh, uh, grading there, I get a lot of resistance. Fiber won't work in environment, harsh environment reactors. Hey, buddy, look at all these uh, studies being done by NASA well, on exactly the same subject, and yeah. they're sending this satellite into above atmosphere, and that harsh environment is worse than nuclear, and the fiber optics can survive such harsh environment. So yeah. be open-minded about it because you can get real-time information without losing any collapse. If any events happening to reactor as far as power density is concerned and water density is concerned, it gives you uh, health of the reactor moment by moment without losing any second of information, particularly with AI behind it, you can process this data much faster. <laughs> It yeah. amazes me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's so many interesting topics to explore. Okay, then we'll call it a wrap on that. And yes, I just want to thank you again for your time. And hopefully this is the beginning of many conversations. Absolutely. Keep in touch. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversations. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear, and is to make positive progress for peace.